Hi everyone, my name is Beth Chandra and I completed my independent summer research grant under the supervision of Dr. Jean Willett in the psychology department. My project analyzes the impact of storybook exposure on vocabulary and studies whether vocabulary knowledge for a given word helps in learning to read and spell that word specifically or whether it is a more system-based phenomenon. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, my summer looked quite different from what was anticipated. To begin, I had planned to collect data from a kindergarten classroom in May. Unfortunately, all schools were forced to close in March, throwing a wrench in my plan. I was lucky that Dr. Willette had previously conducted the same project about a year ago. My original intentions were to recreate the study in order to gain a larger number of participants, but since the previous data had not yet been analyzed, I'm conducting my project using the data from 2019. The study was done by reading to children modified storybooks with embedded non-words. A non-word is a cluster of letters that follows proper English phonology, but does not have a true meaning in the English language. Examples include baz and lerp. The use of non-words ensures that all children are hearing and learning words for the first time during the study. The participants listened to the storybooks three times in one week, where the same modified story was read in a dialogic fashion. Each book contained 10 non-words. Following the reading, the instructor provided additional semantic enrichment for five of the embedded non-words, including tasks of categorization, synonyms, and opposites. Half of the students completed the additional semantic enrichment for five of the embedded non-words, while the other participants focused on the other five words. This was done to allow us to compare the scores. The next week, a second book was read and the same procedure was implemented. Post-testing for word learning, reading, and spelling occurred on the fourth day. During these tests, data was collected regarding the children's ability to identify the words by meaning and by using pictures. We also assessed their ability to spell the words. For the post-tech test, we used all 10 of the non-words, as well as five new words, which were used for comparisons. For the upcoming academic year, I will be analyzing this data and writing my honors thesis. I want to find out if the students were able to learn the meaning and spelling of the non-words and then assess whether extra semantic activities help them do so. Despite the many changes we encountered this summer, I'm grateful for the experience I had to learn about psychology and research in general. I'm excited to have the opportunity to continue working with Dr. Willette and I'm eager to complete my project. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Keely Barnable and I'm a third year biology major. This summer, I worked as the Lowen Health Research Intern and worked under the supervision of Dr. Vet Lloyd of the Mount Allison Biology Department and Dr. Gurpreet Singh Ranger, the head of the Department of Surgery at the Upper River Valley Hospital in Waterville, New Brunswick. I had such a great experience. I learned all about research methodology, project management, and scientific writing, and these are all skills that I hope to take with me in my pursuit of a career in medicine. Throughout the course of the summer, my main work was on an ongoing project on colorectal cancer, a type of cancer consisting of colon and rectal cancers grouped together based on their proximity in the body. Owing to high demand for research on the novel SARS-CoV-2 virus, I also assisted in the development of a second project that aims to investigate the chronic complications associated with COVID-19 infections. Globally, colorectal cancer is the third most frequent and second most deadly cancer type. Although colorectal cancer is much more prevalent in older populations, incidence has been increasing in younger populations and is thought to be the result of lifestyle choices, which is why colorectal cancer research requires further investigation among other reasons. The goal of the colorectal cancer study was therefore to examine survival statistics in the rural community receiving care from the Upper River Valley Hospital. I spent the summer gathering data from 117 colorectal cancer patients. Using this data, I compiled a database of what is probably one of the most extensive collections of colorectal cancer data to date in the province of New Brunswick. Using this database, we performed a retrospective analysis to examine survival statistics and the relationship to other factors such as age, sex, tumor stage, and much more. And this information can help researchers understand the next steps in improving diagnosis, prognosis, treatment, and overall patient experience for colorectal cancer. It was really exciting to apply the skills that I have learned here at Mount A to real data and to discover significant findings related to overall patient survival. For example, we found that overall survival was better for tumors that were below the mean size of 4.6 centimeters when compared to patients who had tumors bigger 
than this size. And these results have been submitted to an international gastrointestinal oncology conference, which will be taking place in October. As for the COVID-19 study, I created many of the project documents that will be submitted for ethics approval and therefore played an important role in the commencement of the project. This role is very meaningful to me and I am so happy to be able to be a part of such current research that is affecting the lives of so many. Overall, I have been very fortunate not only to learn through my research but also to contribute to the progression and knowledge that may ultimately improve the lives of patients in the near future. Thank you for your time. If I asked you to imagine what a philosopher might look like and do, what would you picture? What probably comes to mind, and to a Google search, are established thoughtful men going off to think on their own and coming up with these wild systems and ideas of how the world works. From this image, we might think that philosophy is done by particular people and in a particular way namely by white male bachelors and alone. But there's a few problems with this prototype or picture, and the two main things that I want to point out in relation to my project is that this image makes us assume that philosophy is best done by men and in isolation. This summer, I plan to go to England to work as a student intern with In Parenthesis, which is a collaborative philosophical project that studies the work of four female philosophers. The quartet, as we call them, is made up of Philippa Foote, Elizabeth Anscombe, Iris Murdoch, and Mary Midgley. And what is interesting about these women is that they each stand on their own as philosophers, but they were also friends and did philosophy together on a regular basis. From Philippa Foote, I looked at her infamous trolley problem and her understanding of the doctrine of double effect as saying that it is okay to kill people if we do not directly intend to do so. I looked at Elizabeth Anscombe's disagreement with this and her insistence that some acts, like murder, are never okay in any circumstance. From Iris Murdoch, I looked at her idea that the way we understand the world is often skewed by selfish desire or fantasy, and that living a moral life means being able to see the world as it is, free from the distorting influence of our selfishness. And for Mary Midgley, I looked at a short essay in which she comments on the dominance of male bachelors in the history of philosophy. She makes the point that isolation is not always the best thinking condition, because without the distractions of a family or other people apart from ourselves, it's easy to imagine what the world is like based only on ourselves and without taking into consideration the various kinds of experiences and beings that inhabit our world. A common thread that I found in their philosophy is the desire to work together to find answers to our questions about how we ought to live. They share a concern for morality and for the tools that philosophers and regular people have available to them when thinking about ethics. In our postmodern world, it can be really difficult to understand what is right and wrong because we're so aware of the cultural and societal differences that exist across the globe. But I think the work of the quartet is really important here because they inspire us to find ways of saying that some things just are wrong while also being careful to turn and see the world as it is for all people and not just our own self or group. While working for In Parenthesis, I joined their online reading group, I wrote a few blog posts, I did some interviews, and I created a podcast that explores the themes that I mentioned before. I was struck by their willingness to listen to all voices and the way that they value collaboration. The reading groups were open to anybody, and not just philosophers, and all perspectives are encouraged to speak. So I think In Parenthesis does really well to carry on the legacy of the quartet. So when I picture philosophy now, I try to see the faces of the four women of the quartet, along with all of the people that I've done philosophy with, all mixed in an atmosphere of working to find truth and better ways of living together. Hello to everyone who's watching. My name is Seamus Tobin. I'm a third year pursuing a major in physics, and over this last summer, I worked on a project within the physics department aiming to gain better measurements for the mass of Jupiter's core. Why is this important, you may ask? Don't we already know everything there is to know about Jupiter and all the planets in our solar system by now? Not exactly. We do certainly know a lot about Jupiter itself and its surrounding moons, but there is a lot of things that still eludes us, and one of these things is its core, specifically its mass or how big it is. Finding this out has been difficult for one very big reason. This, that is, because we cannot see the core under its massive layers of thick, gaseous atmosphere, and we do not possess instruments that are capable of reaching its core before being crushed and torn apart under the massive pressure of Jupiter's atmosphere. Right now, we estimate Jupiter's core mass to be anywhere within the range of between 5 and 20 Earth masses, which is nowhere near a precise enough measurement. And that is where this project comes in with the hopes of narrowing this range down much further. 
As I mentioned, there is currently no way for us to directly measure the mass of Jupiter's core, so we need to get creative with how to approach this problem. One way to tackle this is to examine the oscillations within Jupiter's atmosphere, oscillations which vary depending on what the core mass is, using a computer-generated model of Jupiter. Utilizing special software known as Modules for Experimental Stellar Astrophysics, or MESA, I created the said computer model of a planet with similar characteristics to that of what we would normally see from Jupiter today. These characteristics include its radius, total mass, approximate core density, and having to be evolved to an age of 4.5 billion years, the age of Jupiter itself and of our solar system. Then, with this model, I ran it with varying core masses within the 5 to 20 Earth mass range, the range where we suspect the core to be found, at 0.5 Earth mass intervals, then generated data from the necessary evolutionary stage of the model, or when it would be as old as Jupiter is today, four and a half billion years old. Then, applying spherical harmonics to this data, we then will examine the atmospheric oscillations at low orders to find the eigenvalues of atmospheric oscillations with each model of varying core masses within the suspected range of probable masses. The next step for me is to take the data from each core mass model and plug them into a program known as Gyre to calculate their eigenvalues at different spherical harmonic orders. With any luck, at the end of this project, we will have found a suitable match between our computationally obtained eigenvalues found at a certain core mass and the theoretically obtained val the values from our observations and have a more precise measurement of what the core mass of Jupiter really is. I hope you enjoyed listening to this presentation on better measuring the hidden core of Jupiter. A big thank you to my supervisor, Dr. Kathleen Hopkin of the Mount Physics Department for guiding me in this project. Thank you.